Okay, good evening, everybody, and I want to welcome everyone here to our 12th installment of Kingston's Buried Treasures. 12th installment. We've been doing this for a year. The first, when we first sat around and talked about this, we thought we might make it a few months. We thought maybe we could get 20 people to come. So it's been wonderful. We thank all of you, uh, and we appreciate you coming back time and again. And I have to say, we've had wonderful subjects, and we've had wonderful presenters. Uh, and it, tonight, we have a very, very uh, special presenter. Um, and we have a very special subject. And I got to be very careful, because as everyone knows, the pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> and Hugh Reynolds carries a very heavy pen. Uh, and I'm not going to, uh, to tangle with that. But in all seriousness, uh, tonight's subject is the history of Kingston's press corps, the rough and tumble story of Kingston's newspapers. And we are very, very fortunate tonight to have Hugh Reynolds here as our feature presenter. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows either Hugh or of Hugh. I think it would be impossible if you followed any local, state, or national event, or picked up any paper in the past 45 years, you have encountered some of Hugh's works. And uh, Hugh, tru we truly owe Hugh a debt of gratitude for what he's done for us here. Because when we started this, um, we were the new kids on the block. And when we were sending out press releases, they didn't, get a lot, they didn't cause a lot of stir. The one who really grabbed them was Hugh. Hugh said, this is great. This is a great idea. He's been to every single pr presentation. He always writes a big story about it in the Kingston Times. And, and this series has really developed into what it's become in large part because of Hugh. So we owe him a debt of gratitude. And I do want to make, take this opportunity to, to thank him for that. Um, and again, we're very fortunate to have Hugh to discuss the media in Kingston because Hugh has a very unique viewpoint of the media. Hugh has been not only a journalist, uh, he's worked on the editorial staff. He's actually been a newspaper owner. So Hugh has dealt with the print media in every facet. Um, Hugh began with the Daily Freeman in 1966, and he worked there as a reporter and a columnist until 1976. At that time, he left with a couple other reporters from the Freeman to uh, found the second Ulster County Gazette. And many people may have heard of the Ulster County Gazette. The original began in the 1700s. There is uh, a, a hidden mystery of if you can ever find a, one of the Ulster County, the original Ulster County Gazettes. I think it's January 4th, 1800. I think it's worth a lot of money. So check, check your, your basements and see if you have it. But Hugh founded the second installment of the Ulster County Gazette, and he ran that from 1976 to 1979 with two other individuals. In 1979, he became the sole owner of it. Um, so again, he's bringing a really unique perspective to the subject. He returned to the Freeman in 1984 as a political editor and a columnist and, and a, a chief editorial writer until 2008 when he uh, began working with the uh, Ulster Publishing and particularly with the Kingston Times. Most people are probably see him in the Kingston Times, but he's also in all the Ulster Publishing Presses, the New Paltz Times and all those. So uh, again, we are very fortunate. It uh, is my great pleasure to introduce Hugh Reynolds as our featured presenter tonight. Thank you, Paul, for that kind, if not somewhat embellished uh, introduction. I'm not quite the buried treasure that he says, you know, this is an interesting, uh, a part of my uh, talk is going to be about the old media, which is this, uh, me, and the new media. And the new media is quite clearly crowding me out here at this uh, podium. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll be using it. In any case, um, I've written down everything. Uh, I usually don't do that. I tend to wing it at these things, and I uh, tend to forget what I want to talk about. Um, let me see. Um, uh, thanks. This is a nice turnout on a on a hot night. I I was a little concerned. I think we all were. Uh, us, us old folks, uh, the heat can be uh, debilitating, and uh, it looks like a full house, doesn't it, Paul? It is. 
So uh, thank you, uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I would like to uh, especially welcome my two sons, uh, David and Robbie, all the way from Albany. Uh, I, uh, I can't get them down to play golf with me, but they will come for you know, something like this. Thanks, fellas. Uh, some of you may have read about my boys as they were growing up in my, in my columns. They're, they're, uh, they're quite grown up now. Um, I have my official uh, timer here, uh, the, the indefatigable uh, Fawn Tantillo. Fawn is, the, uh, former, Fawn is a former county legislator, but she is the official timer for the Ulster County Legislature. So when you speak before the legislature, you get three minutes, not a second more. So uh, uh, she, uh, <laughs> gonna, she's going to, she's going to, she's going to try to keep me on. Um, kind of, um, and uh, she is, uh, she incidentally, uh, Joe Tantillo's sister-in-law. Joe is, Joe's here. Joe's our graphic guy, and it was really difficult working with me. Because I'm not a graphic guy, I'm a I'm a, I'm a word guy, and uh, J Joe, what Joe, what Harry has left, it was uh, he was pulling it out. Um, I wanted to show you this. Uh, you have this on your at your at your place. Uh, this is the hat, incidentally, which uh, is a family heirloom. This was my father-in-law's hat, the boy's grandfather's hat that he got in the 30s, and uh, he wore it, and uh, he gave it to me because it fit me, and. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've never worn it except for this picture. So it's, it's a good newspaper man's hat, which, uh, which is, which is you know, Clark, Clark Kent type of thing. Anyway, um, if my friend Cynthia is here. Oh, Kevin Kale, thanks for coming, Kevin. Uh, Kevin has always had a keen interest in, uh, in, our, uh, in our history. Um, my, uh, this, uh, uh, this is, as you can see, this, uh, this is the, this is the uh, flyer that was uh, prominently featured. And there's a, there's a prominent uh, uh, typographical error in the top of, of this. It says, uh, the history of Kingston's Press Corp, C-O-R-P. Now, that's, cor that's short for corporation, not Press Corps. And it could have been, it should have been C-O-R-P-S, like Marine Corps, Press Corps. Now, this is where spell check can bite you, because <laughs> it could have also said Kingston's Press Corps. C O R P S E. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to we're going to talk about uh, uh, paper uh, newspapers in the age of in the paperless society. Uh, I have a quote. I'm going to begin with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who is no uh, Paul O'Neill is no a Hamiltonian is no great admirer of Jefferson, but nonetheless you're going to have to live with this. Uh, <clears throat> This was in 1787 when uh, Jefferson was in, uh, was in France as the American ambassador. Uh, the Constitutional Convention was, uh, was being held in Philadelphia, and he was, he was uh, communicating with, with friends and, and keeping in touch, uh, primarily Madison, uh, with what was going on. This is his quote about newspapers. The basis of our governments being the opinion of the people, the very first objective should be to keep that right. And by that he meant not to agree, but to keep them informed, that in forming their opinions, they would have enough information to, to form an intelligent opinion, as opposed to some of the stuff we hear today. <laughs> and if it were left to me, this is the more famous part of it, and if it were left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without, without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. So that's, uh, that's Jefferson. By that, but I should mean, this is to add, but I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. He was also a strong advocate for education. He was a founder of the University of Virginia. So the combination of, a, of an educated public that was well informed through their, in those days, newspapers, now uh, media, was, uh, was a... Uh, uh, a cornerstone of the founding fathers. Um, now, to get on with the Freeman. The origin of the name Freeman, Daily Freeman, is, uh, is uh, uncertain. Uh, maybe Ed Ford knows where it came from, but I, I researched all over the place, and uh, uh, it's, 
there are any number of newspapers, in, but, but almost entirely in the north. I, I, I wasn't able to find any, any newspapers uh, in the southern states uh, before the Civil War that were named Freeman. Uh, perhaps because the name Freeman uh, connotates a, uh, a freed slave, a freed person. And I suspect that there was the, the Underground Railroad ran through our area, and, and it, it, was, it was quite active prior to the war. Uh, there were several other Freeman. There was Freeman Weekly before in the 1840s, before there was the Freeman, uh, the, the Freeman. Uh, oh, I hit a bu I, I hit something. <laughs> All right, let me let me let me just leap forward since it's up there. Um, I covered Maurice Sanchi for his whole career, and in, in fact, before his career, I knew Maurice before he was Maurice. I was I was famous before he was, which is hard to believe, which, <laughs> which uh, suggests that I'm quite elderly, but I did start young. And uh, Maurice at the time was an assemblyman, and he was on a crusade against organized crime. And he was going all over the state, uh, holding hearings, and uh, um, uh, except in Ulster County, which I'm curious, because there is no organized crime in Ulster County. And um, anyway, uh, the boss said to me, or the editor said, uh, Reynolds, get on the phone with Hinchy and let's, let's do a story about this organized crime thing. He, said, he seems to be getting some attention. He was in the New York Times, I think, the week before. So I called Maurice up, and we were, uh, we've had our ups and downs. And I, I, I think over a long period of time, as I look back, there were more downs than ups. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the natural, I think that's more or less uh, the natural dynamic between a reporter and a subject. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're skeptical. And, and, you know, we have to question, it's, it's our job to question them on your behalf, I might add, uh, uh, for the readers. So, uh, so I called up Hinchy, and it was a little frosty. He, 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 he could be frosty. And I called him up, and we're making, kind of making small talk. So I said, Mo, uh, I said, uh, you're investigating this, this, the mafia. I said, those are dangerous guys. I said, I tell you the truth, I would never write a story about the mafia. I don't care what the editor says, because those guys, yeah, they're, they're bad guys. He said, you tell me about it. He said, we did a hearing in New York where a guy testified with a bag over his head. This is the, uh, his environmental, con I don't know what environment, oh, it had to do with garbage, the State Environmental Conservation Committee, which he chaired. And he said, afterward, he said, this little guy with a fedora like this comes up to me, and he put a cigar sticking out, the guy's right out of uh, a B-movie gangster type of guy, Edward G. Robinson look. And he says to Hinchy, you better watch yourself. Now, this is Hinchy's own story. And, and Mo is nothing if not dramatic. You better watch yourself. You better watch yourself, boy. So I said, I said to Maurice, I said, well, that would have been enough for me. He goes, well, I'm not going to be intimidated. Those guys are not going to push me around. So I said, really, Mo? I said, you know, rumors around Saugerties that you have Erica, his wife, go out and start your car in the morning. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> And he didn't say, didn't say SOB, I might add. <laughs> okay, let's go to the, uh, I know I, I, some of you, uh, I mean, this is 150 years ago, so these, these various uh, weeklies that, that, that came and went for various reasons, usually political uh, candidates that rise and fall, uh, they, they seem to start up around presidential elections. In those days, we didn't have four and six and eight year cycles of, of presidential elections. Uh, they would rise up, support a candidate. Uh, if they won, they might be around a little bit longer. If they lost, they would, they would disappear. Uh, very much the same, you see the same names popping up at these papers. So there seemed to be like a cadre of newspaper men, pardon me ladies, but that's how it was uh, 150 years ago, of newspaper men who started uh, these newspapers, uh, bought and sold them, uh, and so forth. Uh, the Roundout Daily Freeman, as it was originally called, uh, began October 18th. 1871, almost exactly 100 years before my son's birthday, uh, as a four-page edition published Monday through Saturday at the corner of Broadway and Mill Street. As some of you Kingstonians and the old-timers may recall the Roundout Savings Bank was on that corner. So Mill Street was about a third of the way up Broadway, as you look up Broadway, on the right-hand side. Uh, 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 it was a self-described and, and, and remains so Republican newspaper. Uh, they were Republicans, uh, the, the people who started this paper. Uh, Horatio Fox, who I never met, uh, uh, changed, uh, the founder changed the name to the Daily Freeman uh, when the villages of Roundout and Kingston merged a year later to form the, uh, the city. Uh, 
Now, this is interesting. Uh, I find interesting the connection with some of these lectures between the characters who were contemporaries, how they reacted uh, with each other. And they must have uh, in a small town, uh, at that, certainly at that social level. Uh, he sold, uh, Falk sold a paper to Kirkendall. Now, we had a lecture, I think Ed Ford's lecture last month up at Montreux Cemetery on Sam Kirkendall in 1876. He operated for two years before selling it to a Charles Marseille who operated for another two years at Three Broadway, which was the old Mary Pease, the old Freeman. Uh, it was called the Opera House in those days. The, the Opera Hall was on the top floor. Uh, and then sold it back to Kirkendall. Kirkendall moved the paper to the Cornell Building, which is now Gallup Park. It was a, a big three or four story, it was a substantial building uh, at the foot of Broadway, um, where it remained until 1911. Now, with, with this confluence, I think is interesting is that Kirkendall's father in law, Cornell, died in 1890, leaving his entire empire to his son in law, who then had a free hand to do anything he wanted. And I, I suspect that Kirkendall was very, very a brilliant businessman must have looked at this pretty much a failing newspaper. This was not a successful business. Uh, it had three owners in its first uh, six years, including Kirkendall twice, where uh, he just divested himself. And along came, along came Jay Clock. Now that name doesn't ring a bell uh, much anymore. Uh, neither does the name Quasimodo. But uh, Jay, <laughs> Jay, Jay Clock uh, is a, uh, 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 we know him, or we know that name today, some of us, from the Clock Foundation. I mean, uh, and uh, I'll get to that, how that, uh, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that, that was the original Clock. Uh, the family was from, the Clock family was from the uh, Mohawk, uh, Mohawk Valley, uh, a, a German, German descent, came to this country, like uh, the Palatinates, is that the, how you pronounce that? That, that, that German, <laughs> large German immigration in the late 17th, early 18th century. Uh, Clock was only 27 years old when he bought the Freeman. I suspect Kirkendall made him an offer uh, that he couldn't refuse because although even at 27, Clock was an experienced newspaper man. He came from a newspaper family. His, uh, his father, who was a Methodist minister, his mother was a school teacher, uh, they owned papers in Michigan and uh, uh, in New York, uh, Oswego. Uh, Clock himself uh, worked for the Albany Times Journal, I think it was called then, as an editorial writer. Uh, so he, he, he was an experienced uh, uh, newspaper guy. However, however uh, even, even in our time, a very young man to be owning a newspaper. Um, his gift, apparently, was that he was a, he was a very smart businessman. He, he ran that newspaper as a business. He built it up. Uh, he, moved, he moved the office uh, in uh, 1911. To, to, to where it was for so many years, bought new presses, expanded circulation, uh, made it a going business. The, uh, the, uh, the Freeman was uh, a, uh, a uh, successful, damn it, I hit it again. All right, so this one has to do with Frank Koenig. Uh, you know, this is working out better than I planned. Uh, Frank Koenig, in, in journalist, journalistic terms, was a tough cover. Uh, it, uh, Rest his soul, and, and it certainly has family, and I, would, I, I don't speak ill of him, but f uh, if Hinchy was tough, Frank was tough in a different way. Frank was uh, very guarded, uh, secretive. Uh, he didn't really say much. Uh, he talked a lot, didn't say an awful lot. Uh, I remember when the first time he, t he said no comment to, to a fairly, like, well, what are you going to do about the sewer that just burst downtown? Uh, no comment. Frank, what do you mean, no comment? I mean, you're the man. The guys in Washington say no comment. We don't say it around here. Anyway, I'm sitting in Frank's office, and we're just exchanging stuff. And it's the old Rondout City Hall. And Frank was at his desk, and I was, I was sitting and looking out a window at the Rondout Creek, and the showboat. Some of you remember the showboat the, that was uh, uh, Captain Furbush's showboat, and they did those comedies on it. It was, it was kind of fun for a few years. I think it, wound up in Eddie, it did wound up in Eddyville. Well, it sank. It had sank that winter. Uh, it was an ice jam. Uh, Furbush and his family lived on the boat. It sank. And it was a big deal to raise it and pump it out. And uh, a lot of people contributed and helped out. And that was a nice thing. Anyway, it's, it was sitting there pretty much empty. And I'm looking out the window, and I see a tugboat 
come, come up from Eddyville, hook onto the boat. Now Frank and I are talking, and Frank's over here, and I'm looking out the window. And the tugboat pulls, pulls and it was all, happened in 10, 15 minutes. It was very quick, it flew, and, and up to Eddyville it went. And Frank had a bad back, and he had to stand up every, every, every now and then just to stretch. He walks over to the window, he looks out, and he goes, get it? The tugboat sank again. <laughs> he, thought, he thought I went down at the dock. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, clock was uh, clock. As you can imagine, the uh, the publisher. It was not the only daily paper, incidentally. Uh, again, old timers, and I'm not one of those, but uh, uh, I, that old. Uh, in 1887, about what was that? 16 years or so after uh, the, the Roundup Freeman was formed as, as a daily, the second daily, a competing daily, uh, an uptown daily uh, in the Stockade area. Uh, the Kingston Daily Leader was founded. It lasted until 1947. That was a Democratic paper. So in those days, in order to be well informed, like watching Fox or MSNBC, uh, you, you can't watch, I don't, uh, no intelligent person watches just one of those programs because they're so biased uh, left and right. But in, in, in any small towns along the Hudson River and I guess elsewhere, there was two newspapers, two dailies in most places, and the population apparently supported that. Uh, if you wanted the Republican view of the world, you read the Freeman. If you wanted the, the uh, I got two minutes. If you wanted the, uh, the Democratic view of the world, uh, you, you read the leader. And the twain did not mix. And I became a city hall reporter when the, 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 the old leader was very much a memory of, uh, in, in, among Democrats who hated the, the Freeman. That goddamn Republican paper they called it. <laughs> Okay, um, like, its, like its predecessor, the Roundup Daily Freeman, the Daily Freeman, uh, Fawn gave me the two minute warning here, uh, uh, has had a lot of uh, uh, changes. Yeah, this is only the first section, folks. I'm hardly warmed up. Uh, has, uh, has, has moved. Um, let me see now. Oh, in 1966, now the Freeman was a hometown paper. It was owned by people who lived here for most of its history from 1871 to 1966. Uh, ironically or coincidentally, I got there in 1966. And uh, I actually worked for Mrs. Clock, imagine that. Um, anyway, in 1966, uh, they, um, the paper was sold to a, to a, to a, uh, a small chain owned by uh, Mark Goodson and Bill Todman of Beat the Clock fame, which is, think about it, somebody named Clock sold the paper to somebody who beat the clock. <laughs> and I've got a secret. It was another one of their shows. And um, they, were, they, were, uh, they, were, they were fairly benign uh, uh, ownership. They, uh, they, they were content to just, just take the cash. And it was a cash cow for many years. Um, the paper, the paper, uh, the paper changed his name. I know people still call it the Kingston Daily Freeman, but it's been officially the Daily Freeman since 1966. Um, in 1971, uh, they began publishing a Sunday morning edition. Sunday morning, with the rest of the paper, except for Saturday, it was still a six day a week paper, was uh, afternoon. And in 1974, the paper dropped its plans to build a new plant in Broadway East. And if I had more than two minutes, I could tell you about that. They, they, the, uh, the Freeman, who was as committed as they could be, was committed to building a new plant in the Roundout Urban Renewal area, uh, Broadway East, which was desolate. There was nothing down there but empty fields. And Koenig was ecstatic. That, that the, he, he believed, and I think rightfully so, that if the Freeman put its faith into that Roundout area where it sprang from, then others would follow, which was the whole idea of building Roundout City Hall. If we build it, they will come. Well, they didn't. Uh, what happened was there was a steel strike. Uh, they had ordered the presses. They were paying rent on these presses that were built for that building, and they had to move. And the A.M.P. up on Hurley Avenue uh, was was for sale, uh, and they they bought that. So that's that's how they got there. Uh, and, and with uh, uh, the new presses, uh, in 1987 the paper became a morning daily, much to the chagrin of its of its longtime readers who apparently resist any kind of changes in their daily newspaper. <laughs> Need I say more? Uh, <laughs> and his paper, yeah, and his paper boys. 
<laughs> who all of a sudden had to get up first thing, you know, at dawn and uh, you know deliver papers. He didn't like that. Yeah, Robbie was a paper boy. And David helped out. One time when Robbie was hurt, Robbie was constantly falling off his bike. He was hurt, and, and, and David and I took over his route. And David charged him more for the route than he was getting paid by the Freeman. <laughs> smart kid, that kid. Now, in 1998, um, the Journal Register Company out of, I think, New Haven. Well, New Haven is their flagship. They're out of Jersey. Uh, these, were, these guys were gunslingers. They, uh, they, uh, they formed this corporation. They went around buying newspapers at top dollar, uh, floated all kinds of junk debt. Uh, it was a house of cards, and it collapsed on them rather quickly. Uh, and they went, they went bankrupt in 2009, and uh, in 2011, um, uh, this, is, this is significant, I guess. For the first time in its history, the Freeman began printing its, its, its newspaper off-site in, in Troy. Now they print in Albany. It's kind of a contradiction in terms for a daily paper to print someplace other than where it's published. But it did, and it does. Uh, we'll talk about the future uh, at some point. Uh, okay, so we've talked about some of these. I'm, I'm going to hit a couple of other newsroom stories for you. Most equally as equally amusing as the last one. Um, you know, reporters live vicarious lives. We're we're really mediums. We're we're nothing ourselves. It's just who we knew, or who we who 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 we interviewed, who we wrote about. Uh, I'm I'm much more famous than I deserve to be. It's only because I've been here forever. Um, I came to the frame in April, mid-April, and about a week later, under a cloud, I might add, uh, I had been at the Poughkeepsie Journal for about eight months, and they had a firm and fast rule that if you're late twice, you're fired. The second time I was late, I was fired, and I miraculously got hired by the Freeman. Was, apparently, they saw something I didn't. Certainly, the Journal didn't. But anyway. I'm sitting in the back of the room, and I, uh, it's a, at the old frame, and I hear one editor say to the other, hey, Rocky's down in New Paltz. And the other guy goes, no kidding. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, uh, who's covering it? Uh, gee, I don't know, uh, nobody. Darn it, we got the governor of the state at New Paltz? We don't, we don't cover it? We got to cover the thing. And I look up, and there's that girl sitting in the back of the room, me. Reynolds, get down there and cover Rocky. Holy cow. So I go down. And all the way down, I'm thinking of an intelligent question I can ask the governor of the state. I've never interviewed anybody. I was, I was, a, uh, I was what they call a, uh, oh, uh, no, no, the, the, the word is uh, uh, the jack of all trade reporter. One, one week I'd be working in, uh, in what they call the society department doing wedding announcements. The next week I'd be doing the police beat. I, I, had, I had no assignment. And uh, so I get down there and uh, Rocky was dedicating something at the college as, in, his, in his fashion, and he spoke, and at the end of his speech, the press corps, including me, surrounded him, and we, we were standing up like this, and people are just throwing questions at him. And I'm praying nobody asked my question, because I've only got one. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and my mother taught me to be polite and respect my elders. I think I was 23 or something. And it was all grizzled old veterans like me were, were there. I'm from, from all over the region, because I mean, the governor showed up someplace. That was a big deal for any, any governor. And um, so if I'm the last person to ask a question. And, and, and I'm standing right in front, this far away from Governor Rockefeller. And I'm sort of studying him while he's talking. And he, he wasn't a bit, he wasn't a, these guys are always bigger, uh, I should say smaller in life than and up close than they seem to be. And, and he had this really neat pinstripe shirt on and really tailored, he's Rockefeller, right? So he looks at me, he kind of nods my way, he's, he wants to move on, I haven't asked a question. So I asked this long, elaborate question. It has to do, I, I'm, I'll paraphrase it for, for time purposes, but essentially I said to him, Governor, uh, you're, you're building the, uh, the complex in Albany, you're rebuilding the uh, state uh, uh, university system, you say it's going to be, the, and it is now, the largest in the country. Uh, you're repaving all the roads. Uh, you're redoing the throughway. Some critics think that maybe you ought to set some priorities, and you're borrowing money by the billions, that you ought to set some priorities. Uh, uh, so, 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 so you look at me and say, okay, well, what's the question? I, sa I said, uh, do you think you can do all this stuff uh, at the same time, or will you have to set priorities? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, I wrote down. 
<laughs> you know? <laughs> he said yes. <laughs> ah, Gordon Liddy. <laughs> dropping names again, Reynolds dropping names. Um, Gordon, Gordon Liddy was, like most public figures, was, was really a non-consequential person. When he began, he was an assistant district attorney in Dutchess County, uh, f infamous for firing a gun off in, uh, at a, uh, at a cross-examination of a witness. Uh, uh, witnesses said they, they didn't hear the gun, and he brought a gun, uh, with blanks, I assume, into court and <laughs> fired everybody, jumped, the jury jumped, the judge jumped, the judge slammed the gavel down, he made his point. If a gun goes off, you, you usually hear it. So that was his kind of his claim to fame. Well, he was, a, as we all know, was a right-wing Republican nut, and, and he was active in, the, in what was the newly emerging conservative party, and in that year's uh, primary, that year's uh, primaries, he, uh, he got the conservative nomination, Ham Fish got the Republican nomination. Well, that was a serious issue for Ham Fish because he was running against John Dyson, and, and, if, and if Gordon Liddy ran or split that vote, he would, he would have lost. So they made a deal that got Liddy to Washington and to, to ultimate fame, but my connection with him was, it was a Friday afternoon, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, at, the, I'm, at, I'm at the paper around three o'clock, and uh, I'd written a couple of stories about the Vietnam Symposium that the college, uh, Ulster Community College was uh, putting on. And uh, the kid who was, kid, I was 24, the kid was 19. Uh, uh, the kid who was putting it on calls me up and he said, Mr. Reynolds, I used to love becoming Mr. Reynolds when I was uh, in my 20s. Uh, he said, uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds, we got a real problem here. He said, we've got this symposium going on and we can't find anybody to speak for, uh, 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 for the war. And he said, the kid knew enough. He says, you can't have a symposium with everybody on the same side. We've got to have at least one person, you know. So I said, I just casually, I said, call up Joe Resnick. He's a, he's a hawk. Joe Resnick was a congressman who had not yet read the handwriting on the wall regarding Vietnam. That, uh, that was not a good position to be a hawk on Vietnam in 1968 and, uh, and, and lost a Senate uh, race. So I said to the kid, gee, you know, there's this guy over in Dutchess County, Liddy. Uh, I think he's against the war, but for different reasons. He wants to nuke North Vietnam. He wants to turn it into a parking lot. That's his solution. So I said, let me see if I can get him. I said, no, there's no guarantees. It's 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. These guys are never around yet. So I call up, and Liddy picks up his phone. Hey, Gordy, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I said, so here's the a, here's a situation. Do you, think you can, uh, do you think you can make it over here uh, at the college at 7 o'clock tonight and, and speak? Uh, for the war. I, I know you're against it. He said, not a problem. He said, if you know the facts, you can talk either side of an argument. And he did. And he, he faced down all these hairy professors and the, and the kids waving a fist in his face and everything else. And he did not burn you know, the, the, uh, the hair off his arm or anything, but uh, he saved the day for the kid. The, the, the kid was astounded the next day he called me. Ham Fish is, I just gave you some of the connection to Ham, Ham Fish and Gordon Liddy. All Fish did, Fish was an honorable man. He was not a sleazy politician. He wasn't a big deal maker. You, you, could, you could take him at his word. Uh, he was a good, good man. Um, he got, the deal was, Gordon Liddy, don't run. We'll get you a job with the Treasury Department. He was a lawyer, he was qualified, et cetera, et cetera. He gets him a job. And of course, then, you know, it hits the fan. Uh, prior to that, in, 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 in Fish's race against uh, Resnick in uh, 1966, which he lost, Fish's father, Hamilton, a former congressman, put billboards around the district saying, vote for Ham Fish Jr., a real American. I will not go into the connotations of that. Of that. Uh, I'll give you a hint, Resnick was Jewish. And Jewish people bitterly resented that. They hated the old man. They liked Ham, Ham Jr. for some reason. Anyway, Fish is, Fish is giving a talk at the uh, Temple Emanuel breakfast. He was a congressman then, had been elected several times. And somebody raises the subject of Gordon Liddy. It was a Q&A, Gordon Liddy, and, uh, and uh, his father. Fish handled it pretty well. He goes out to put his coat on. Fish was a big guy. He's about 6'4". He must have weighed 250. A big, big man. He's putting on his coat that looks like a blanket. He's 
putting his coat on and, and he's muttering. He, I'm, I'm behind him. I just want to get a quote from him about, about something. He says, God damn it. He says, every time I go to one of these places, all I hear about is Gordon Liddy and my father. Is they ever going to forget that? And they don't. Okay. Oh, you go, you'll appreciate this story. Uh, sales tax, Kevin. I don't know if you know this story. <laughs> every, no, no, this is not about Kevin. It's about sales tax. Every two years, sales tax is a controversy because it has to be renewed and extended. And, and the same arguments come up. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and then things happen or don't happen, and et cetera. This one was somewhat different, had a little more context than the others. But in any case, this is about the origin of the sales tax. Ray Garrigan put the sales tax in on a, he called the council, common council, into special session, which the mayor has the authority, on a Friday night, two days before Christmas, in 1968, because he knew he'd never get the sales tax through the common council if the uptown businessmen, if the businessmen, excuse me again, business community heard that a 2% sales tax was, was, was going to be enacted in Kingston. Ray, who was, a, who was really a financial wizard, understood that the tax base could no longer support the extravagant spending that he and his fellow politicians were engaged in. They needed a new source of revenue. And, and this was about as, I know Kevin disagrees with this, but this was about as harmless as, uh, as it could get. Unfortunately, that night was the first and last Freeman Christmas party on site. It started at noon, and if any of you folks are, are, uh, uh, remember the 60s, you probably weren't there, but uh, it, was, it was a pretty rowdy party, and it was a lot of drinking, and it was Friday, and, and about 6 o'clock, we get a phone call to paper. It said the Common Council is going to the session 15 minutes, and they're going to act on the sales tax. I knew nothing. I mean, I'm only in the city hall report. I was pretty drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but duty called. Duty called. I can't believe I drove up to City Hall, but I did. I drove up to City Hall, and I got there, and uh, I couldn't write. I couldn't hold a pen in my hand. <laughs> and Jim Thompson was covering it from G GHQ. God rest his soul. God bless him. Jimmy says, Reynolds, don't worry about it. I'll write the story. I'll leave a carbon, because he was on GHQ on the radio. He went on the air at 6 o'clock in the morning. I went to work at 7. He says, I'll, I'll leave a carbon. Remember carbons, carbon copies? I'll leave a carbon of my story that I'm broadcasting in the, uh, uh, there's a little box at the, at, the, at the foot of the stairs at GHQ. So I drove over the, you know, on the way to work, on the way to the Freeman, opened the box there, it was an envelope, Reynolds, written on the envelope, yes. And the story said, the carbon said, that uh, the council, uh, in a surprise move and you know, the other, all the other stuff, had approved the sales tax, seven to six, split vote. So I write the story. I knew enough of the background of players and all that. Just knocked it out. Still quasi-sober. And uh, knocked it out. The papers ran at 12 o'clock on Saturday. And they were in the basement, in the first floor of the building, and the whole building shook. It was like a car starting up and going into gear and getting louder and louder. And the building literally shook. And the paper started, the, the presses are rolling with that story on, big headline. Council, council approves sales tax. Phone rings, it's Jimmy Thompson. He says, Reynolds, I don't know how to tell you this, but somehow the uptown businessmen got wind of that there was a special meeting they got to the alderman. I got it backwards. They shot it down seven to six. <laughs> to this day, my heart stops. <laughs> and then that laugh of his, that, 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 ah, gotcha, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, you did. Son of a bitch. Took 10 years off my life. <laughs> this is just a little vignette. Uh, um, Pete, Pete Mancuso was, uh, was a good alderman. I think he was a good legislator. Uh, mayor, mayor wasn't really his forte, uh, but he was an early mentor of mine. We, you know, we all have people who, uh, who help us along the way, Ed Ford, people like that. Uh, I was writing some pretty, pretty colorful columns about, as a new reporter here, about the characters that I ran into, and, and I like to uh, analyze stuff. And uh, I'm, a, I'm not too bad at deductive thinking, uh, reasoning. 
I'm not good at inductive reasoning, but I could, I could usually take little bits and pieces and put them together and come up with something at least plausible. And I'm writing these guys up like they're geniuses. And uh, Pete pulled me aside, best advice, some of the best advice I ever get. He said, Huey, you write really interesting columns. He said, really entertaining stuff. He says, you're a good writer and all that, colorful, what have you. He says, but, quote unquote, these people aren't as smart as you think they are. <laughs> Get that in mind. Then there was, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the end of this. Uh, this is the last, this is, this is Ray Garrigan again, not to date myself and the, I dearly miss that man. Uh, they level ground out, it's gone. Well, there were several thousand people who lived in those, those tenements. Those, is, uh, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty bad section of town. And where are they going to go? So there wasn't enough housing in, in Kingston uh, to, uh, to relocate that number of people. So uh, the plan was to build public housing, which they did, Rondell Gardens, down in, uh, uh, down in Rondell, to uh, uh, this uh, affordable housing uh, for this population. And, uh, the Kingston Housing Authority would, would, would build, build this and, of course, manage it, which it has. Well, the Kingston Housing Authority had what they called a morals clause. I know, I know, we're, we're living in the 21st century. The morals clause said that an unmarried person could not have a, a guest of the opposite sex, I don't know how they handle gay people, but a guest of the opposite sex stay overnight of either sex. So if there was a man living there with his kids, mostly there were women, single mothers, younger, youngish women for that matter, and, and they were evicted. I mean, out, no questions asked, the morals clause. So when the federal government got wind of this, and it was in writing, when the federal government got wind of this, they're gonna be paying for this, for this housing. And they're saying, wait a minute, what, what is this, this 19th century stuff? This is nonsense. We're not gonna fund a building project where you have a morals clause where people can't act like adults. And there was, there was, there was you, know, you know, give and take. So Ray was, Garrigan was, was, was notorious for floating trial balloons on Thursday and then going to the Cape. And then on Monday, he'd ask, hey, how'd that go? Oh, yeah, no, no. And I, I was not a very, you know, you, you learn to be sophisticated, I guess. It, it, sophistication comes with time. Anyway, he gives me the story. He says, Reynolds, he calls me up just before he left. And he says, uh, Reynolds, I got big news for you. Exclusive, just for you. Okay, what well, he goes, uh, and he whispers in the phone, he goes, Kingston Housing Authority has dropped its morals clause in order to build uh, 150 units of housing. I said, holy cow. <laughs> I, I write it up. Big headlines, Kingston Housing Authority drops morals clause. Well, they did not. <laughs> and Al, Al Alexander Yasman, who was the director, he came up those stairs at the Freeman two at a time, waving that paper. And I was, oh God, I, I was so embarrassed. I, I went into my boss and I said, I violated a cardinal rule of journalism. I didn't talk to the other side. All I had to do was pick up the phone and Ali Osmond is said, that's bullshit, excuse me. That's, that's not gonna happen, but I didn't. I offered, I thought, I tried the noble thing. I offered to resign, because I saw that on television. When you screw up that bad, <laughs> you resign. So I offered my, res my resignation to the boss, and he laughed at me. He said, hey, listen, get back to work. He said, if you can't believe the mayor, who can you believe? <laughs> okay, now, gee, you know, we're running a little, I, I can tell a few more stories if you, if you mind. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future. I think it's kind of interesting, uh, think about this, newspapers, newspapers in a paperless society. Sounds like a contradiction in terms, it might well be. Um, this has been going on a while. I mean, so, <laughs> some of the dinosaurs only noticed in maybe in the last ten, five years or so, but the, uh, the move to a paperless society is, uh, if anything, accelerating. Uh, paper's probably gonna be obsolete. So how do you, uh, how do you put out a newspaper like, like this one? This is, this is, oh, I didn't talk about the Gazette. All right, I'll, I'll talk. This is a paper I published that, uh, that Paul, Paul mentioned, he also counting. John Childers, thank you for, for digging us out of your attic. Uh, the, 
various papers from from the New York Times down to the Daily Freeman have have been have have have, uh, have tried to deal with this uh, this dilemma of how do we uh, how do we get what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll talk louder. Yeah. 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 And you missed most of it. Did you hear the one about fish? You got that. And of course, it has to do with revenue, uh, uh, as as Jay Clock uh, demonstrated, uh, and believe me, I demonstrated in in a perverse way. Uh, if you can't run a newspaper as a business and make it make money, it's got to make money. It doesn't have to make a ton of money, but you got to make money to pay the bills and and do the things you need to do. Uh, if you can't generate the revenue to to do that, uh, you're not in business anymore. I know it sounds simplistic, but a lot of people go into newspapers uh, as I did. Uh, Idealistically, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a newspaper. Oh, yeah, let's let's put on a show. We're going to. I remember we 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 talked about our our goals at the Gazette. That the three of us, the, the three reporters who knew nothing about any discipline in the newspaper. We knew nothing about advertising. We knew nothing about circulation. We knew nothing about business and marketing. All that stuff. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We were reporters. We but we were full of slogans. Uh, and the high ideals. One of them was we were going to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> There's a noble goal. And uh, you know, we were, we were, and so forth. So, so now the dilemma for the papers is uh, they're not getting the advertising. Uh, circulation is down because people, young people, in effect, I, my sons are probably in the middle of that curve, but uh, but younger people coming, uh, people in their twenties, the future of of any business, of any community, uh, not reading newspapers. Uh, they get it on the web, get their news on the web. Well, that's problematical. I'll give you an example of news on the web, and I was victimized by it. Uh, when Maurice Hinchy was retiring, or had announced his retirement, I did a little research, because people like to re read this kind of stuff. How much is his pension? All right. Maybe some people that's, think that's intrusive. But he's a public official. You know, what's he get paid? I read on the web on several sites that a congressman retires because they can. They vote themselves their own benefits. It's not like the rest of us. You know, we've, you know we, we have to go with what they give us. A congressman retires, member of Congress, I should say, retires with full salary and full benefits for the rest of his life. And with a slight tweaking of that formula, his spouse uh, 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 enjoys those benefits. Well, I don't know how many of you folks are retired, but my, my pitch is nothing like that. So I wrote that up. I, I wrote it because I'd seen it so many times on the web and, and in, in print. And it was, it was one of those urban myths that just got around. And when he retired, his, his wife said to me, Hugh, uh, you need to correct that. She said, I wish Maurice was getting his full salary. <laughs> She said, she said, I said, well, how much is it? Well, she said, it's closer to 70000 That's not a bad pension, but it's, the salary for a congressman member is $175,000 a year. So, uh, and that's out there in the web. There, there, are, no, uh, gate, there are no gatekeepers. It's, it's, it's the, the journalist, the, 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 the experienced professional journalist with experienced editors uh, supervising them, uh, the diligence that they uh, that they that, that they have to put in to uh, to make sure that uh, to double check stuff and and and, 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 and ten. ten okay and and certainly these these few examples I've shown you of rather shoddy journalism is just funny but in the vast majority of of, of, of cases people check and double check uh, you know to make to make sure it's accurate there are no such there are no such uh, restrictions on bloggers uh, on people on the web. Uh, say pretty much anything you want, and it's a pure form of democracy. That's for sure. And, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, your boy Hamilton uh, was was afraid of that. That uh, the mob, as he called it, would 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 just uh, be 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 ruled by impulse and emotion. And uh, the, the medium is here now. And so I guess the question is how how are we going to get our news? I I would hope that there's a generation of and, and I, I think it's emerging of uh, of uh, web journalists who who will exercise the same kind of discipline and and diligence uh, and care 
and judgment. Uh, we make judgments all the time on what goes in the paper and what doesn't. Uh, it can be very subjective. Uh, some of it has to do with your own experience. You know, what's a news story? Uh, should we put Marie Sanchez's pension in the paper? That's a judgment call. Uh, ultimately, I might, you know, I, I made one judgment, other, other people, but there, you know, there's some things that, that, that just, uh, they're just frivolous and, uh, uh, and gossipy and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and fluffy stuff that, you know, that passes for, uh, for news. I think, they, I think they call them sound bites. Um, getting back to the future of the Freeman, I, it's, it's, it's sort of ironic uh, that as I, uh, uh, I, I, that this week's edition of the Kingston Times, I wrote about uh, the retirement of uh, Ira Fussfeld, publisher, longtime publisher of the Freeman. Um, Ira will retire uh, two weeks from today after 43 years. At the, at, that's, and he was my boss for about 25 years. Um, I think the people, as I, I like to refer to them as the cowboys who owned the Freeman, who have twice taken it into bankruptcy, and it wasn't the Freeman's fault. The, the Freeman uh, has been has been has been has been making money since uh, since Jay, since Jay Clock took it over, and a lot of money, and that money fed a lot of their other investments because they just kept cranking it out. It was a, it was almost a license to print money. Uh, they uh, they and they they've cut to the bottom line. They, there's a bottom line that says we want to take whatever the number is. I believe the Freeman is probably a $50 million business. Um, Clock sold it, as I understand, from, from, a, from a drunken negotiator. Uh, Clock, Clock sold it for about $5 million in 1966. Uh, and, at, and at its peak, it was running about 30% after tax profit. And it's those, that's, that's a cash cow. So to get the key, either keep at 30 or at least stay in the 20s, uh, you see it all the time. IBM just did it. Uh, they, uh, their, 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 their latest earnings report came out, and it wasn't as good as they made billions, but it wasn't quite as good as as, as they wanted. They were projected, so they laid off a thousand people here in Hudson Valley. See ya. Okay, so they they cut and they cut. I predict that they'll go to within a year to three days a week. I think this, I think this makeover that they, that they just uh, did uh, is, uh, is, a, is a step in that direction. Uh, the days, Sunday obviously will be a big day, uh, probably Wednesday and maybe Friday. Uh, so you'll have, uh, you'll have a weekly, you'll have a semi-weekly paper. Uh, by the same tokens, the weeklies may expand. Now, this is another, uh, this is another niche in, in the newspaper business. And not, not because I, I work for weeklies. We're uh, not telling tales out of, out of my school, but we're, we're, we're kind of bobbing along. We're not, you know, like everybody, like a lot of other businesses, we hit that dip during the great, what's now called the Great Recession. I like that expression. We hit that dip too, and then we leveled off, and, and, and we're slowly, slowly rebuilding, much like the economy. Um, these, uh, these, these, these small town niche, niche, is that the word, niche, niche? Weeklies that focus entirely on local news, on their local communities, to the exclusion of everything else. If you want your national news, read something else or go on the web. Uh, that uh, there's a there's a market there, even even for uh, I think even for younger uh, readers, uh, younger families. Uh, they're not going to find out uh, what what their school board is doing. Or, or what curriculum is being uh, uh, done. Uh, they're not going to find out about a new rendering plant that, that, that may be going up down the street uh, from, from other, other sources other than word of mouth. So, so there, there is that. So in, in, a, in a sense, journalism in our community, which began with weeklies, is uh, coming uh, full circle. Uh, I think, uh, I kind of hope my own chain, <laughs> some chain, uh, <laughs> I think our circulation is only about 12,000, so that's not much of a chain. But uh, on any given day, we're, we're as, we have as many readers as the Freeman does on any given one day, uh, that, uh, that our chain expands, that uh, maybe we go two days a week. That's a big step, and it's uh, in uncertain times. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that I think, is the, I think is the state of the, 
state of the business. So I'm pretty much on time. I got a few minutes, right? I have three minutes. Geez, I want to give you more time than that. Are there any questions anybody would like to? Uh, anything I haven't covered? Or, what is it? Yes, sir. What do you think of the new uh, Freeman format that they came out with? You know, um, I've seen a lot of changes in that paper over the years, and I've never seen one that wasn't uh, uh, resisted and criticized by, by readers. Uh, and, I, and I'm not blaming the readers. It's just human nature. Uh, this is something very personal to most people. Their newspaper is a very personal thing. It comes in their home. It's their newspaper. Uh, they, they can criticize it all they want. It's a rag, I hate it, but it's their paper. And they don't like people tinkering with it. And uh, uh, I know when we start running color, I say, what the hell are you running color on page one? Well, now you, but uh, I find it hard to follow. I find it hard to read. And I think the first rule of layout has gotta be readable. And, I'm, I don't, and, and I think it's pretty much cookie cutter. It's not a new idea. There's, 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 there's uh, their, their, their flagship in New Haven, which is a big paper, uh, has almost exactly the same layout. Poughkeepsie Journal has similar layout. Uh, it's nothing revolutionary. I, I don't know if it's my eyesight, but I believe they've reduced the type a little bit. <laughs> and that's not, uh, that's not good. Oh, I forgot the best story. Thank you, Phyllis. God bless you. I'll take this real loud. It's called, Oh My God. I thought it was up there. Oh My God, it's, ra it's raining fire. 1974 was a very interesting year in a, in a lot of different areas. It was the year, uh, of course, Watergate. Uh, it, was the year, uh, uh, it was the year that the, uh, what is now the walkway over the Hudson went up in smoke, and a lot of smoke. It happened uh, uh, about two, the fire, fire broke out about 10 or 11 in the morning, and we could see it from the downtown Freeman, not, we could see the smoke rising to the south, 16 miles away of, the, of that bridge burning. And so, uh, <laughs> me and the Freeman, I don't mean to disparage my former colleagues, but we didn't send anybody down there. We got on the phones and we called the Highland Fire Chief and we called the Poughkeepsie Fire Chief and we called the state troopers. And, 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 and we got a, their eyewitness account. You know, we were concerned about things with anybody injured uh, uh, how long the fire with the, yada, yada, yada. Uh, with the bridge collapse. You imagine that bridge collapsing in the Hudson River and this and that. So the, the reporter who wrote it wrote what we call a straight narrative. Just who, what, when, where, why, when. The bridge went up at 11 o'clock. The bridge is 1,200 feet long, yada, yada, yada. There wasn't a single quote in the story. So the editor, they, they hand the story over to the managing editor and he comes storming out of his office and he goes, he looks out the window, he says, God damn it. We got a bridge burning in Poughkeepsie. We can see the we can see the smoke from here, and there's not a single quote in this story. Get me a quote, okay? One of the editors, a young guy who we just hired, was from Poughkeepsie. He knew that the eastern end of the bridge ran over the Italian section of Poughkeepsie, uh, Mount Carmel Square, and all that. Those of you who've been down there 40 years ago, it was, it was just a lovely Italian neighborhood. And there was a Polish neighborhood, just like Kingston. You have, you know, different ethnic uh, neighborhoods. And this was long established. They had their own church and everything, school. The guy writes, he says, he, he wants a quote, I'll give him a quote. Rolls the, rolls the paper back into a typewriter. Remember those typewriters? <laughs> rolls it back into the typewriter and writes across the top, quote, oh my God, it's raining fire, screamed an unidentified Italian woman. <laughs> unquote. And he says, give the son of a bitch this quote. <laughs> and he hands it to him, and the guy goes, now that's more like it. <laughs> but he ran in the headline. What? Are you a good speller? What? You... What? Are you a good speller? Who, me? No. <laughs> oh, gee, that's embarrassing, but it's, 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 it's gross. Uh, when I was working at the Poughkeepsie Journal, I was a good speller in school. I was like the last boy out of the spelling bees. Girls were always better than we were. And uh, I was the last boy, so I was considered a good speller. And then I lost it somehow. I, I didn't, didn't write a lot or I didn't, it's like any other gift. And uh, so I go to work for the Poughkeepsie Journal and uh, they, they notice right away that my spelling is uh, you know, problematical. And I bounce around a little bit and I wind up in the sports department as a, as a sports writer uh, which at least was something I liked to do. 
And uh, unbeknownst to me, the sports editor, who was only a year or two older than me, I was in my 20s, every time I misspelled a word, he had a roll of toilet paper in his desk, in his top drawer, and he would write the word. He'd never say anything to me, he'd just correct it. Never say, but around she spelled cat wrong. He would just correct it and write it down the way I wrote it and roll up toilet paper. So after six months, you can imagine a guy who's misspelling a dozen words every day, it adds up. So I go in for my six month review to the managing editor, and these two clowns, I cooked this thing up between them anyway, unbeknownst to me. And uh, the sports editor, so the, the managing editor says to the sports editor, so John, uh, how's, how's, how's you doing? And John says, well, you know, uh, Ed, he's got a decent narrative writing style. Uh, he, can, uh, he can certainly bring it back and so forth and so on. He says, but I got to tell you, Ed, this guy can't spell for shit. And he rolls the toilet paper <laughs> across the floor. And it went like 30 feet away. <laughs> oh, I was just devastated. And, 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 and the boss at that time said, listen, Hugh, uh, how old are you now? I'm 23. You're not married or anything? Nah, I live with mom. Okay. Is your car paid for it? Yeah, I'm almost. Uh, he said, you're not going to make it in this business, he said. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you on until you find something else. And then a week later, I was late, and I found the Freeman. <laughs> yeah. uh, with this digitalization and change of the format of the world, you know, everything going digital, uh, I had occasion to call the Freeman today, and I called 329, 9300, circulation number two, and I spoke to the lady, and I said, where are you? She had an unusual accent. <laughs> India? <laughs> But it's dry down there. You don't, you don't feel it. My desk was right next to the circulation department at the old Freeman. And boy, I, like I said, people, people take their newspapers personally. And when they don't get that paper, if it's 5.30 when it's supposed to be there, 5.35, boy, they are on the phone. And it was almost like a, a, a Bob Newhart routine, you know, where he used to do on the phone, you know, when he did thing. And you'd hear the circulation guy go, yeah, I'm sorry, madam. Yes, I know. Please, 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 please don't use that. that that's, that's not good. You can't, you, you can't call my mother that, really. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's very personal. How do you come up with your Christmas No, no, I don't, Fawn. Every year when I write the thing, I say to myself, I should jot these ideas down as I go along, but I don't. I guess it works. Uh, it's the only list that I, I handwrite I have a yellow legal pad, and it's in my top drawer. And around the middle of December, I, uh, I start to get ideas. I start to get ideas, and I start to write it down. And I'll, I, uh, I'll write down, I'll handwrite maybe 50 of them. And then I'll you know, type them in. And after that, I'll just, uh, and they just pop in my head. Yeah, they, uh, they're, they're, they're apparently were very popular. People, people, would get, people would get upset when they were not in. <laughs> Even though, you know, it's, and some of it was a lot of it was tongue in cheek. Some, some of it was, uh, some of it was, uh, a lot of it was inside jokes. Some of it was just messages between me and the person. And my idea was, by cumulative effect, there's always 125 names in there. So you get 125 names, and you know, thousands of readers. And it's, it's, uh, it's work. Uh, Ira didn't like that. He, he didn't like it because he didn't get any of the jokes. <laughs> And uh, I didn't care. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Any other questions? It's not every day that you get to ask you a question. He's usually asking you the question. <laughs> I would take advantage of it if you could. No other. No further questions. I'd like to thank. I told Paul to reserve like five minutes for the high fives as I left. You know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you, Hugh. And uh, I have to say, this year, I actually made it into the Christmas list. More people came up to me. That's when I knew I'd made it. So, Hugh, thank you for that. And tonight, you just got a little taste of Hugh. And I think you can tell, uh, if you ever get a chance to sit down with him, and I'll, uh, this, the process of this presentation tonight, for me, has been wonderful. They all are. Uh, but Hugh and I would meet fairly regularly and go through the pictures that, that were going to be used in the PowerPoint. And every time we'd start talk, you know, we'd talk about what we were doing. And invariably, we would get off on tangents. And we'd talk for about everything. And it was a, a wonderful experience for me because you really got a bird's eye view of the important events, the important people in the history of Kingston. It, is, it has been a wonderful experience for me. And I'll tell you, when you see him walking around, he's usually going from one place and one story to another. But if you do get a chance to sit down with him for a few minutes, you will not be disappointed. As you could tell tonight, uh, you, you'll be laughing. You'll be astounded. It really has been a wonderful. Hugh, thank you. That was a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, and thank you for waving the flag for this series from day one. Uh, uh, you know, you'll have to, don't, many, many reporters and authors use, used fake names. You know, what are the gnome de plume? Yes. Uh, but, you thank you. That was, and it's very important. I mean, the history of Kingston has been set forth in our periodicals, in our papers, whether they were dailies, weeklies, and from the beginning almost, that has been an integral part of, the, of perpetuating the history of our, of our community. And it is, it's a changing time now, and we hope that it, it does resolve itself in a way that continues. Because what really would be lost? Really everything. And I'll tell you that I get the Freeman too. I'm starting to get used to the new format. Give it some time. Maybe, maybe you will. Maybe you will. So again, Hugh, thank you. I also do want to take the opportunity, we always try at the end of this, to thank some of the people that make this series and the history of, of our community. Uh, available to everybody. Nobody expects it. Nobody does this for the publicity. That's why it's so important to recognize them. Uh, again, first, Hugh, thank you very much for that. We want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, the Senate House Museum, we always say it, but the, you know, the Senate House Museum stays open for us. They set all this up. Tom and Jacob bought all the chairs from here to Montreal Cemetery last week. Uh, and I'll, it's one of these pictures is actually an is relevant to how we got here. Here's that. It was there. It just got zipped through. Oh my God, it's raining fire. That's a great quote. I don't care who made it up. Whether it's real, it's a great quote. This picture right here. This picture is the picture of Maurice Hintry when he was announcing his retirement. It was done right here. You see the mandolin. Right yeah. And I saw this in the, the picture of the Freeman. When we started this series, we were looking for a location to have it. And it was originally contemplated that we would do this in the Lowren house next door. And when we met, and Tom was bringing us around, and I said, what about the room that Maurice Hinchy did his retirement speech in? It just looks like such a, a cozy, comfortable room. And Tom said, yeah, yeah, we could do that. That's how we ended up in here. And it's a great room. Uh, it's perfect for what we do. And Tom, thank you for allowing us to do that. And Jacob and Christine and everyone, thank you for everything you do. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Bob Rizzo, again, Bob is a true professional. Bob spent his career working at NBC. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He, if you've ever seen the videos for these events, they're actually better than being here in person. I don't want to tell you that. I shouldn't have told you that. Um, please keep coming, but they are. And he actually has a table in the back of past presentations if you want to get them. They are wonderful. I did the first one we did. I don't know if it's around. If you see it, you're going to notice the difference. It was a mess. It was horrific. Uh, so, Bob, thank you for everything you do. Again, all the people who publicize the event. Most of you are here because you've seen it somewhere from some of the people who have publicized it. Hugh, again, uh, Hugh always from the beginning, writes a, a, a big story about our subjects. He's really waved the flag from day one. Uh, Jillian Fisher, she sends out uh, mass emails and has really been wonderful in promoting our series. Friends of Historic Kingston always puts uh, uh, our 
uh, flyers up on their website and they tell everybody about it. In fact, we have Peter Roberts is here, he's the president. Pat Finch is on the board. Uh, so we thank everybody at Friends of Historic Kingston. If I'm, I, I'm not really looking around, if I, I hate to ever miss anybody. Uh, Ulster County Tourism, Anne Marie, and uh, everybody throughout the county who really helps out with this. Kingston Community Radio, Kingston Happenings, the Daily Freeman Preview, and Walt Wachowski and the Civil War Roundtable. They always put it on their Facebook page uh, as well. We thank them. And again, Walt Wachowski, last, when we had the presentation last month at the Montrepo Cemetery, great idea in theory. It ended up being spectacular. But getting there was a little more difficult than we expected. And I'd go there every day after work to try and do this or do that. Every time I was there, Walt was there scrubbing tombstones, so I really do want to thank him. Kingston's buried treasures. It's not easy to put this on. It's a lot of effort. Um, Ed Ford has uh, been a presenter several times. And again, Ed is really the, the seed for our history. Everything kind of comes back to Ed. So he's, a, he's wonderful. Ed, please. Uh, Ann Gordon is, Ann is here in the back. She just raised her hand. Ann is the Ulster County historian. She's part of Kingston's Buried Treasure and is really one of the national experts on Sojourner Truth. If you ever have a question on Sojourner Truth, please ask her. I do a little presentation for the jurors uh, every week prior to you know, a little history on the courthouse. Ann was there as a juror a few weeks ago. I talk about Sojourner Truth, and I'm going to tell you, I felt like I was under a spotlight. I, I did not want to make a mistake with Ann being there. Uh, Pat Murphy, I don't think Pat's here, but Pat has done an unbelievable job for us. She actually has uh, just published a book through the Friends of Historic Kingston uh, the, on the Kingston's postcards. It's wonderful. It's a walk down memory lane. Uh, you should please try and pick it up. You'll love it. Tom Hafe, he's our, our alderman. He actually works with uh, Assemblyman Kevin Kale, who's here tonight. Uh, Tom is actually going to be a presenter next month, which I'll get into momentarily. Nina Pasupak our Ulster County Clerk. She avails herself to us and is, is so helpful throughout the history of Kingston. And Joe Tantillo. Joe is really the MVP of uh, Kingston's Buried Treasure. Again, all the slides, uh, all the flyers. Joe does all those. We, we finished up the these, uh, PowerPoint presentation this morning. So Joe really drops everything to make sure we have everything. Uh, and again, all of you. Without you, we wouldn't be here. So, you can't thank yourself. You can't thank yourself. Uh, but everybody give yourself a round of applause because you really are the reason why we're keeping Kingston, the history of Kingston alive. It is so important. So we appreciate it. Uh, as always, we'll tell you the next two subjects. Uh, August 16th, uh, Tom Hafe, again, our, uh, our alderman, is going to be doing the presentation on the history of Kingston City Hall, the house that united Kingston. Uh, if you don't know the history of City Hall, uh, the Roundout and Kingston were separate. Roundout was actually significantly bigger than Kingston. Roundout wanted to become a city. Kingston saw that and saw that that was a, a very, very potential threat to them and really did a one-upman. And they, so Kingston became the city. So there was a rivalry there. And the reason City Hall was built where it was, where it is now, is because it was in the middle. At the time it was built, there was really nothing there. Uh, so it's an amazing building. We're actually going to be doing it at Kingston City Hall. We're going to be doing it in the Common Council Chambers. If you haven't been there, it's absolutely beautiful. So we're going to, we hope to see you there on August 16th. September 20th, we are going to be doing Christopher Kit Davids and the early round out the strand, what we would consider now. Uh, and Kit Davids, we deem and term Kingston's original rebel. Uh, and that's going to be by Mark Freed. I'm sure many people, if you're interested in the history of Kingston, Mark Freed wrote a book called The History of Kingston. It really is one of the, one of the true authorities of early Kingston. Uh, so, and Kit, Kit Davids was one of the original settlers of Kingston, but he never, ever lived up the original settler, settlers lived in what we call the lowlands, which is kind of where the Hannaford Plaza is now. In 1658, they made an agreement with Peter Stuyvesant to relocate to the Stockade District, where we are now. And they all moved in. Kit Davids never did. 
He always lived down on the Strand. He was a trader. Um, he was someone who really lived outside the bounds of society. He was a very interesting character, and Mark is going to tell us all about him. So again, we thank all of you. Hugh, thank you very much. Everybody have a, a cool weekend. We hope it gets better, and, hope, and we hope to see you August 16th.